afternoon, everybody, or evening. Um, I'm JJ Gladden. I am uh, lucky enough to be the ARE, which is Aquatic Resources Education Program Coordinator, and we're uh, we're really excited about tonight. So we're going to give some people some uh, give people a little bit more time to get in here. So we're going to start off with a video that's found on our virtual nature center that we just posted today, just for this uh, seminar, and it is. Uh, bass tackle box. So for all the beginners out there, just a, a kind of a, a neat little video to show you some of the things that'll help you get started. Often when you think of bass fishing, you think of Big, expensive bass fishing bait casters, big lures, heavy line. But to get started, you don't have to have any of that. Here we've got just a perfect simple tackle box ready to go to get you started bass fishing. We're starting with a six to six and a half foot spinning rod, eight pound line, about a 3000 series reel. And then to catch bass, all year long, we just want some, some simple tackle. I like a stick worm, like a Cinco. Uh, for the spring, I like a floating worm. Bubble gum is a great, great color. Uh, just let you see them real easy. Then you're also gonna want some, some hooks and some heads for that tackle. Uh, we've got some shaky heads. We've got just some regular two to three uh, offset shank hooks. Uh, you got to have some hooks for your wacky rigs. And then we've got some 316 ounce bullet weights. That will get you catching fish almost all year long. Also, some other artificials. We've got some, some crankbaits, some topwaters, which those will be kind of seasonal. Uh, but they're great colors. You're always going to want to mimic. You're going to want to match the hatch. So we're looking at crawfish colors shad colors, other bait fish. This simple setup is all you need to catch bass in the natural state all year long. All right. Um, like I said, that's from our virtual nature center. So just wanted to share that resource with you. Give a Give people a little bit of time to get in here. That's something that we'll put in the chat, the link to that. There's a ton of uh, fishing videos in there. So, and, and hunting videos and all kinds of other videos. It's a, it's a really neat resource that we have. So we'll give it a few more minutes. Uh, I do ask that everybody stay muted. We will be doing uh, questions at the end. We may break, uh, midway if we say something that just keeps popping up but we're going to ask that you put the questions in the chat box that way we right. can keep track of them and not lose anything as we go through this we are slated to do one hour um we've got uh, a few questions that we we've already got lined out that we think will will help alleviate some of those uh additional questions but like i said feel free to put any questions that, that pop up into the chat and we'll we'll go through as many of those as we can. If if we don't get to your question, feel free to email me, um, and and we'll get you taken care of. So it is it's close enough to six oh five that we are going to get kicked off here. So for anybody that joined um, after the video, my name is JJ Gladden. I am the uh, Aquatic Resources Education Program Coordinator. We call it ARE internally. So I am lucky enough to get to help people uh, find their outside, to, to get them comfortable fishing, going out. You know, Maybe they need a little bit of help to get started, but give them all the tools that they need to, to go outside go fishing, have success, and then become mentors and, and anglers, you know, help out their friends and family. So it's, it's a really neat job and I'm super lucky to have it. Tonight, I've brought in an illustrious panel. Um, 
if you follow Game and Fish on Facebook, I have no doubt that you know Will Hafner. He um, he basically keeps Facebook running. I mean, I'm not sure how much money is tied up in Facebook for Will, but uh, he definitely should buy stock. I'll tell you that. We also have Brad Shell. He is a uh, a tournament angler, lives in Little Rock, and a great resource to get a outside of the agency perspective for this. We also have Vic Desenzo. He is the black bass biologist for Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. Figured we might want to have a biologist on here that uh, that maybe deals with bass. Nick Adams uh, is an avid bass angler down. He uh, he is the manager down at Grandview, down around Hope, and we also have the uh, the talented, illustrious Amory Doramus. And I think uh, I, if you know Will, you know Amory. She is uh, she's out there. She is uh, a very huge advocate for Arkansas Game and Fish, and we're lucky to have her here tonight. So. I will let them uh, talk a little bit more about themselves, but to to kick this off, we're going to kind of do a around the uh, around the table of why we actually why we fish. Like that's that's a pretty good question. I think uh, that we're going to have some different answers on this, but it's something that we all uh, we may or may not think about. But it's a it's a pretty good question to to kind of get a feel for. Um, what motivates people? So let's uh, let's start with Anne Marie. Hey JJ, thanks for putting all this together. Sure, I'm happy to be a part of it tonight. And uh, you know, it's always fun to talk about fishing, especially bass fishing in Arkansas, because we have so many lakes, so many rivers, and the opportunity is out there. And I like to hunt too. Don't get me wrong, but fishing it to me is so much more relaxing and as far as teaching somebody and introducing them to the outdoors it's such an easier entry to get them started so happy to be here why i fish it's fun it's it's my sport it's what i've it's what i've grown up doing and i wouldn't have it any other way you know i wasn't interested in playing basketball cheerleading anything like that i wanted to go fish so i guess that's really why I do it is because I love it. Best way to describe it. And also it's fun to go out and uh, harvest some fish and fry them up too, which my man, Will Hafner, uh, Half Daddy Outdoors, as he's referred to on Facebook, may go into here in a little bit. So that's why I do it. And I do it also to pass it on to the next generation. Perfect. Uh, let's, I mean, she referenced him. Let's go to Will. All right. Uh... I'm Will Hafner, uh, Education Specialist for Arkansas Game Fish Commission down at Cooks Lake Education Center. I love to hunt, I love to fish, uh, all sorts of reasons that I like to fish, but the main one, I like to eat. I like to eat and I like to cook, and therefore fishing is a food source for me, uh, not just for fried fish all the time, but just seeing all different recipes that I can make from fish, uh, all the different types of fish, I know we're just talking about bass tonight, but there's there's so many underrated fish species that are just phenomenal to eat. And honestly, bass is one of those. Uh, and there's lots of videos on the Virtual Nature Center about cooking bass that we've done. And it just, it's what I really enjoy to do. So that's one of my favorite reasons to fish. Okay, thank you there, Will. Brad, tell us about you. Hi, I'm Bradley Shell. Um, why I fish? I basically fish. It's basically kind of been passed down to me as far as family goes. Uh, um, years ago, before I came here to Arkansas, we used to always go fishing up north and uh, in the Wisconsin area. My family, my mom and dad, my sisters, not so much, uh, but uh, it really stuck with me and it's something I really enjoyed and really got into and. Um, pretty much carried it on. My sons, uh, back when they were old enough to, to, to go out fishing with me, I used to take them with me on a regular basis and they're pretty much hooked. And uh, it's just such an involved sport that you can really include so many people. You can do it by yourself, but you can also include a ton of people. And I really enjoy being with my family and uh, we all like to go out, 
out and fish. And of course, the competition level gets in there too. And um, we just really have a good time when we go out. Awesome, thank you. Uh, let's let's hear from Nick on this. Hello, everyone. Uh, Nick Adams here at Rick Evans Grandview Prairie. Why I love to fish. Now we could be here all night talking about this subject, but uh, I'll keep it short and sweet. The the moment that it takes for your mind to register that you have a bite, that is what I live for, right? That's that's something that that wakes me up in the morning. That that moment that you don't know if a is that a fish or a stump, right? One of those one of those lunkers that you're not real sure. That's the moment that that I'm there for. Right, and I want to have that moment as many times as I can. Uh, so that that's what I'm I'm coming for, right? I want to catch as many fish in a day as I can. If if uh, if I catch a limit, that's great. Uh, if I catch more than a limit, that's great. I'm gonna let the other ones go. But uh, just like Will, those ones that uh, fit inside that slot limit or what I can keep and take home, they're going in the frying pan. So that's what I got for you. Awesome, thank you. From Nick to Vic, let's let's see what the black bass biologist says about it. He's on mute. There we go. Thanks, JJ, um, and welcome everybody. I appreciate the opportunity to be on here. I've been a fisheries biologist for thirty years, but only four months in Arkansas, and I'm blown away by the quality of the people in the agency and the. <clears throat> the resources in the state. It's just been terrific being here. Um, all of the motivations that we've heard of so far have to do with fish, right? That's why we fish. Well, I can have a great day fishing even if I don't catch anything because uh, my motivation sometimes is just to be in nature, be near water, um, and just being in a peaceful setting. You know, water, there's something alluring about water. People always dream about having a, a lake house or a cabin on the river or something like that. And it's just a it's it's just a place where I can I can find some tranquility. I can relax. Um, it sometimes it helps me think clearer about things. Um, and because bass can be found all over the state, nearly in every pond and lake, bass fishing is going to allow me to have that tranquility no matter where I am in Arkansas. Um, and also, smallmouth bass can live in, in in our beautiful streams. So there's opportunities no matter where you live in Arkansas. So. My goal may ultimately be to catch fish, but my motivation is to is to really sometimes just be in a beautiful natural setting, uh, and and my satisfaction is is derived from that. AJ, yeah, um, you know, I, I really identify. I mean, I identify with a lot of these answers. I mean, who doesn't like that that feeling of like Nick's talking about when you you got that little tug on the end and you're like, oh man. I hope I'm not hung up again. And then you realize, oh man, it's moving. Here we go. But, you know, nature, I, I love just being out and kind of getting away from things. Like I, I do love the social aspect of fishing and don't get me wrong, but just it, whether you're with people or by yourself, you can still be escaping the, the everyday. And I mean, I think that, uh, a lot of people realize that in the last year, you know, the world's just kind of been a crazy place. And to, to get away from that, heaven forbid you went somewhere fishing and you didn't have cell service and you didn't get the updates on Facebook and all that. I mean, that would just be a tragic situation. So I think my answer to this might be escaping uh, the busyness of the world. Uh, Cause now that we have these, these great and they they are a great tool i mean what now that we have these phones basically a computer in our pocket you know it, it's harder and harder to get away from things now granted we can use that uh, tool to go at agfc.com buy a license maybe go to the virtual nature center watch some how-to videos but you know there's there's definitely a time and a place and and sometimes you just want to turn the thing off so thank you all for uh, your answers and maybe everybody has got a little bit of a better feel for, for the, the differences and that we have in this panel. So to, to familiarize people a little bit better 
with our panel. Um, I've got a, a little little game here, little little idea. Maybe it's not a game. Maybe it's just a competition. Are we doing an icebreaker game? Well, I mean, it's kind of... Are you going there, JJ? Uh, maybe, maybe. So I want to know what everyone's go-to. Like, I hope I did tell you to bring your tackle boxes. I think Nick's fiddling with his right now. Put it away. Don't show everybody. All right. So I want to know what everybody's go-to lure would be. And since I said lure, I'll go ahead and get mine out of the way. Like, there's just something about these guys right here. And it doesn't have to be a worm. It can be minnows or crickets. But we're talking bass fishing, so worms, you know, there's just something about live bait. It's, it's a little bit purist. You can go and catch your own. I mean, who doesn't remember when they were a kid going out and, and digging your own worms and getting grubs and crickets and all kinds of things like that. And that's how, like, if you didn't go get your bait, you may not be able to go fishing. So like, maybe it's some nostalgia, but I just, there's something about using live bait that, that really gets me fired up about fishing. So we're going to go back around the horn, maybe in a new order here, and we're going to see what everybody else's favorite slash go-to lure is. And we're talking about bass fishing. I know. So no more crickets, stuff like that. You can, you can use a cricket. I mean, I'm sure if a bass is hungry, it's going it, to anything and it get its mouth around, it's going to eat. So it's got all right, Anne-Marie, go for it. What, me? Already? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, I, hey, I, I want to tag on to that. I've caught plenty of bass on a cricket, and occasionally, if you're really <laughs> feeling adventurous, you put that cricket on a fly rod, go to a local pond, you can catch some bass. It's a ton of fun. So I'm kicking, kicking mine off. Now, this is a little bit more advanced, but a ton of fun after you get on the water a couple times, and that is the Whopper Plopper. <laughs> this bad boy right here goes through the water you see it's got a little spinning tail right here two treble hooks on it you see it right there it's got this little tail i'm trying not to poke myself with one of the one of the hooks but uh this is a top water bait uh tie it on throw it out there uh up against the bank especially early in the morning late in the afternoon reel it in and you want to fast you know kind of want to reel it in fast and those bass will just jump up and hit it. it looks like jaws on shark week how you see those uh see those great whites in south africa jump up on the bait that is how a bass hits this bait and it is so much fun so that's my that's the best thing i can come up with is you know comparing it to a shark and then also Right here. This is a topwater frog. Yeah. That bad boy. It's got two hooks in it. Same deal. Tie it on, throw it up against the bank. Uh, works best morning, afternoon, but really you could hit it up any time of the day uh, or up against a tree if you're fishing somewhere like Lake Millwood. Uh, you know, the bass will get up underneath those, the root balls of the tree and they will jump up on this like crazy. Um, so that's just another top water bait that I've been a huge fan of. One quick tip that somebody told me a long time ago because I kept on getting so frustrated when I'd throw the top water bait and a fish would jump up and hit it and I'd lose it. Uh, one of my buddies, his name's Harry, he told me, he said, throw it out there, let the fish hit it and count to three. One, two, three, and then set the hook and then reel it in and you'll catch more fish. That's my tip of the day. I like that. <laughs> I'm, tip I'm not of the even going to charge you for that one, JJ. <laughs> well, this is a competition. When we get do, done talking about our favorite lures, we're going to poll the audience and uh, see what we see, uh, see who won. So that tip of the day may put you over the top. You know, it might. It might. That's what the goal is. I'm after you, JJ. All right. Come on. <laughs> All right. All right. Will, go ahead. All right. I may have cheated a little bit and got kind of broad with with my lure selection because I would always select a jig. 
Um, a jig is very broad, though, because there's so many different types of jigs out on the market. Uh, a couple of different ones I always have in my tackle box. Anywhere I go in the state, across the nation, I'm going to have a green pumpkin finesse jig with a little bit of orange in it. Uh, I do have a soft plastic trailer on it. Looks like a crawfish. Then I've also got a black and blue half ounce flipping jig. Uh, this is a bigger bait, probably about a five inch profile. So, I mean, you're going to be looking for bigger bass with this. This one catches fish of all sizes. Uh, but what I like about a jig, not just these types, they can mimic all sorts of different uh, a bait. These mimic crawfish, but you can get different colors, kind of white, silver, to mimic bait fish. You can swim them. You can let them go right to the bottom and hop them up and down, fish them fast, fish them slow. Uh, there's all sorts of different ways you can fish these different environments. If I'm going to be stuck to one lure for the rest of my life, it's going to be a jig. And it would probably be that 5 16 ounce finesse jig. Uh, you also have jigs like a shaky head jig that you put a soft plastic on. Uh, another nice thing about jigs is they're relatively inexpensive. Uh, you can get them a couple bucks a piece all the way up to four or five dollars a piece. Unlike your other hard baits that may be 10, 12, 14 dollars, especially like that whopper plopper, uh, you can have these nice, more inexpensive baits. And even another great thing, if you like to tinker around in your shed, you can make jigs yourself. Uh, you can get a jig, a mold, it's called a jig, so I guess a jig jig, and pour your own jigs and customize them to whatever you want. Uh, and you can have some secrets that nobody else is going to know about because you customize them and you're going to be able to catch all the fish. So that's what I like. I like a jig. So let's see what Brad likes. Well, what I will definitely have in my bag as far as lures, favorite lure or go-to lure that I will consistently get bites on and catch a plenty of fish would be the worm. The finesse worm is one of the most versatile baits that you can use. And I like, I prefer black, but green pumpkin and black is gonna be my two colors that I'm gonna use. This worm will flat out catch fish, any lake, any color, any time of the year. So if I only had to have one bait, It'll be a finesse worm in black or green pumpkin. All right. Um, is, that, is that all you got? Just the worm there, Brad? Well, you said one, right? Okay. All right. I, I kept sure. the one. <laughs> I'm just making sure. I, I, oh, I got plenty of other baits that I love yeah. to use, but okay. I mean, all if right. I had one. The black worm and the green pumpkin worm, those are awesome. And they work They work anywhere. Anywhere, any water, any time of the year. Oh, yeah, buddy. Yep. All right, Nick. I know you didn't get it down to just one. Oh, I tried real hard. I tried real hard. But I got the winner right here. Okay, this is what we call a spinnerbait. And I promise you every professional bass fisherman in the world has multiple of these in their, in their tackle box, right? And there's a reason why. Uh, super, super versatile bait. Um, we're going we're gonna to kind of go in depth of why we're going to use these in the time of the year. Uh, so as you can see here, the, the shapes of these two blades here, these are called what we consider to be willow leaf blades. Um, now, the different types of blades, what we're trying to key in on is going to be the lateral lines on the side of the fish. That's what uh, all the fish are going to be using to de detect the vibrations in the water. And different times of the year, bait fish either move slow or they move faster. Uh, you can kind of use the water temperature to kind of dictate what type of blade you're going to be using. So in the fall, what I'm going to be throwing is a double willow leaf spinnerbait uh, and burning it. So what I mean by burning, I'm going to be reeling it in very fast. Uh, this, I'm, I'm reeling it in fast because in the fall, uh, the metabolism of fish are still very fast coming off the summer. 
right? They're, they're eating a lot of fish and they're, they're eating a lot of food. In the fall, the water is, is cooling down, so they still have a lot of energy. Their metabolism is still high, so they're willing to chase down very fast uh, bait species. And what we're trying to mimic here are, are what we can, uh, different types of shad. There's multiple different species, but it kind of, you kind of see this right here. This is a, my trailer that I've put on here. Um, you can kind you can put a paddle tail on there, maybe a, a, a twin, tw a twin tailed grub, something like this. Um, but let's see. So if you want to go fast, you want little bitty vibrations in the water, you're going to be choosing the willow leaf right here. Uh, there's also what we call a Colorado leaf right here. What that's going to do is going to put a little different thump in the water. Uh, so the vibrations that the lateral lines are picking up on the fish are, are going to be different. This is also going to slow the bait down. We're going to kind of use this in the springtime because we want to stay in the strike zone longer. Uh, you can also see right here the color, the colors that I've chosen here for the spinnerbait. This is mimicking a bluegill. So right now uh, in, in the springtime, probably most, mostly across uh, Arkansas right now, is we, we are in the three stages of spawn. Pre-spawn, spawn, post-spawn. Post uh, the color selection that we have here is mimicking a, a, blue, a bluegill. Uh, bass do not like these around their fries. Fry is the baby, baby bass. They will do anything they have to to get this away from their babies, right? So that means they're going to put it in their mouth and you're going to catch them. Uh, so, one thing. Uh, everybody else, you see this little orange thing right here? In water temps, about uh, let's say 55 to 60, orange is a very key color that we're going to use as anglers to catch these fish. And you can use these across the spectrum. Uh, they're, the orange is, there's something about it that bass love at that water degree temperature in the spring. Uh, so that's, that's a few tips and we could go on and on, but JJ, <laughs> I'm going to win this. Y'all get the spinner bait out there. <laughs> Man, I, I mean, okay. We went to a little detail there, but that's okay. I think you got some, some good tips out there for people. So I'll allow it this one time you you've used up your mulligan. Hey, Nick, I keep an orange marker in my boat, too, and I'll mark on the bottom of some soft plastic. So that is true. Water temperature gets right. Yep. All right. Nick, and one more on that, JJ. Oh, go ahead. The soft plastics that I use, as mentioned, they also come in creature type baits. And also, the like what uh, Vic was explaining about the uh, what you use on your spinner baits. And these different baits here, they come in different sizes. They come in the finesse size, the regular size, Hold it up and, the higher, Brad. and the magnum size from anywhere from four to five inches to up to 12 inches. And then you also have baits that mimic crawfish and lizards and a combination of both creature baits, they call them. And then you have your minnow type baits. Yeah. And that's what we also use for soft plastics. Now, since I was only subjected to that one, that's what only I gave you for the worm. I got but it. Any got of those baits would be baits you can use any time of the year. All right. I I like it. I like some creature baits. All right, Vic, what's your what's your go-to? I'm gonna drive this conversation in a different direction. And it <clears throat> probably has to do it probably aligns with my my uh, my motivation of just being outdoors but I really like to catch bass with a fly rod. And we often think of associate fly fishing with trout fishing or with saltwater fishing, but fly fishing can be really, really effective uh, for catching bass. Uh, big difference is, is that you've got a, a rod that is uh, much longer, very light action. So even, even small bass will, will feel really good. But the different, the distinction between fly fishing and, and spin fishing is with fly fishing, the line is weighted and the lure is weightless almost, as opposed to throwing a heavy lure with a monofilament line, which really doesn't weigh anything. So that's a big distinction. It's a really, it can be a more subtle way to fish, it can be a little stealthier. Um, it's often considered more challenging and that goes into some motivations as well. Um, and it doesn't have to be expensive to get into. So uh, you can fish uh, 
flies below the surface, like this would be a streamer and it would mimic a, uh, like a minnow. But what I really like is to fish something that's gonna cause uh, bass to come up and, and hit the surface. So this would be like a little uh, fly or a grasshopper, um, but you don't even have to tie those. And the cool thing about bass as opposed to trout is you don't have to match the hatch. Uh, we heard that term earlier. So you can just get a little popping bug like this at any of your fishing stores for less than two bucks and there's no telling how many bass I and mean, paints already wore off of this one that this is seen uh, it they probably don't hit it like the whopper plopper but they they do hit it and it can be a lot of fun so i really like uh just trying something different to catch bass i like the fly rod whopper plopper shout out <laughs> yeah but that doesn't mean you're gonna win all right everybody um if you don't mind put in the chat who you uh Go with names. We can we can uh, assign names to this. Go with the the person's name whose lure you think sold it the best, or maybe just who's going to have the most success out there. So go ahead and put those in the chat. And while y'all are working on that, we are going to hear from a little switch of gears. We're going to let Vic keep on talking and talk about a few barriers to bass fishing that people might uh, might perceive. And I will get that shared screen fired up for you. All right, thanks, JJ. Yeah, so the, the big purpose of this seminar is to, is to teach you a little bit about bass fishing, equip you so that you can be successful and hopefully spark, uh, spark your interest and, and create some excitement. Um, but maybe there are reasons why you don't bass fish or you haven't bass fished before. We call those barriers. Um, so next slide, JJ, unless you want to talk about the picture. One more, one back up. There we go. So when we think about what a bass angler looks like, uh, what do you picture? You probably picture um, those images at the bottom of the slide where you're thinking about a, a large expensive boat, uh, you're thinking about a tackle box, uh, so many lures that you can open up your own store, you're thinking about um, uh, bait casting rods, very expensive and lots of them as Will talked about earlier. Um, and you might even just picture a tournament angler, a, a, a man or woman that loves to fish tournaments. But that's kind of uh, a little bit of a, a stereotype that it's really not that accurate. Bass fishing, a bass angler can be just about any person that, that you can picture. So if you look at the images up top, it could be fishing from the bank. It could be a family affair. It could be fishing from a kayak or from a, uh, let me put that pole off, or from a, a kayak or a canoe. Um, and you can fish. We, we heard uh, JJ talk about live bait and Bradley talk about the soft plastic. So there's just a lot of different uh, opportunities to sort of make this a lot less expensive of an endeavor. Um, it doesn't have to be a $60,000 boat and um, all the different gear. Uh, doesn't necessarily uh, make for a better experience. Um, so when you think about after this, and when you, when you picture what a bass angler uh, looks like in your, in your head, maybe you'll think about, you know, some, some different types of uh, uh, angling types, if you will. Next slide, please. And when you were picturing that bass angler, you were probably picturing him or her in that fancy boat racing across one of Arkansas's big, beautiful reservoirs, uh, places where tournaments are held. But one of the great things about being a bass angler is that you can literally find them everywhere. Farm ponds are a great resource to go uh, bass fishing. Uh, many subdivisions have ponds uh, in them where you can uh, almost guarantee that there's a bass population there to catch fish. Same for golf courses, but you know all of, all of those are private waters. Uh, you would have to get permission uh, before you go bass fishing there. But you know one of the great things I mentioned earlier about being in this state is Arkansas has just some unbelievable uh, fishing lakes uh, that hold good populations of largemouth bass. Um, you can you can find lakes that have uh, you know high catch rates of maybe some smaller fish, and you can also have uh, maybe some lakes that don't have as as many fish, but the quality of the size is a lot better. Uh, and then also in Arkansas, we've got rivers and streams throughout the state that also have uh, spotted bass and smallmouth bass. So 
the, the, AG, the AGFC website, uh, which you're going to hear about in a little bit, has a tremendous amount of information to sort of help you narrow in um, uh, and getting around this barrier of, I don't know where to go fishing. Next slide. And is, is your, a sort of a social network is, is, is not having somebody to go bass fishing with, does that keep you from bass fishing? And my guess is that it's so popular in Arkansas, the chances are, you know, somebody um, that really likes to go bass fishing. Um, and it could be a friend or a family member. It could be somebody from work or church. Somebody uh, is, you can probably connect with someone uh, close to you uh, to, to get out there and, and fish. And I think Amber mentioned this earlier, one of the best connections you can make uh, as, a, as a bass angler is to introduce some youth, young adults, people that have never bass fished before and get them interested in it. So, you know, connect socially, get that, get that network going, and then maybe, um, maybe you can break down that barrier yourself and for other people as well. So chances are in Arkansas, you know somebody that bass fishes and you live somewhere where there's, where there's great opportunities to catch bass. JJ, I'll put it back to you. All right, thank you very much. So you- Hey JJ? Uh, yes, go ahead. Can I add on to that real quick as far as resources go? Please do. All right, well, I wanna say that some of the best resources that I've found are also at your local angler shops. Uh, I know that's where I find out, uh, you know, local easy places to go, what to fish with, uh, what kind of line to use, um, what reels to have, what rods. I mean, it's just a really, really great resource. And from what I found uh, is that the people who work there are always so delighted to share their knowledge because it's something that they're passionate about. So keep that in mind too. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's a, it's a little bit late for the hot tips. I mean, we've already, the polls have closed. So you're, yeah, maybe we'll do a people's choice award at the over. end. So, so Vic was talking about being able to find water bodies um, near you that are going to contain bass. And he's absolutely right. So let's go ahead and let Brad talk about uh, what he looks for in, in a water body. I'm going to say public water body because uh, if you've got access to private water bodies, you probably uh, already know what you're doing and are going to get out there and, and catch some fish. So let's talk about some public water bodies. Well, in many cases, when I go to a public body of water, I'm looking for cover and structure. Now, cover is mainly what you, what you can see across the water or on the land, basically. Bass love hanging around grass lines, lily pads, thick, thick weeds, and overhanging brush and laydowns and stuff in the water. So anytime I'm going from the bank, you know, and I'm out of the boat, I'm going to look for stuff like that. And I'm going to target those areas to fish for the bass. Now, in many cases, I'm, I'm knowing that I'm going to have to have some significant gear at that time. Um, most of the time I'm going to have uh, heavier than 10 pound test line. I use mostly anywhere from 14 to 20 pound test line when I'm fishing from the bank, because as, as you know, in making cash, you'll get hung up on stuff or when you're fishing around cover for a bass like that, you got to be able to stick them and pull them up out of there. So you want heavy enough line to get them out of there, but I'm really going to be targeting those type of situations. Um, and in cases like uh, if you're fishing around trees and brush and stuff like that, you're going to really try to get down in those particular areas with your bait, preferably something like I said, a soft plastic or something you can easily slide down in there. And, and if they happen to bite it, pull them out without getting hung up. Um, and when you're making your cast, you want to angle against the weed lines or pad lines or find the open spots in the pads to toss your lure into to get that bass to hit. And as I said, you'll have significant enough uh, line to, to set the hook and pull them up out of there. So uh, a lot of public body of waters, you, 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 you it would at least have grass and maybe some pads. And in a lot of cases, you'll have trees that'll be uh, falling into the water or uh, just happen to be uh, an area where there might've been trees in that lake or whatever. So. That's what I look for when I go to public waters. 
Perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah, parallel in the bank is a, a pretty good tip. Uh, Will, let's go ahead and talk about um, something that I know you and I have talked about quite a bit. We actually made a video about it um, about one year ago, actually. I think we put that out in April on the, the whole catch and release situation uh, versus catch and keep, I think is the way you titled it. So I'm going to start the shared screen for you. Well, generally, when you think of other types of fishing, your brim fishing or crappie fishing, uh, even a lot of times trout fishing in stocked waters, you think about keeping fish, no one says anything about it, but when you start bass fishing and you start keeping bass, a lot of times there's a negative connotation and people just aren't happy about you keeping bass and just say there's no sense in it, they need to be catch and release only, but is that really the case? <coughs> Not always the case, honestly. Uh, one part of fishing, one component of fishing is conservation. And releasing fish is not always the best conservation answer. Uh, there's times when keeping fish to take home and eat, that is so much better for the resource than it is to just let them all go. Now, I'm not saying go out there and keep as many fish as you want because that's, that's definitely not what we need to do. We need to make sure we've got one of the most updated copies of the fishing reg book. Because uh, every body of water has, not everybody, but a lot of bodies of water have their own regulations. We want to stick within those, those limits, whether it be just a number, uh, a size limit, or a slot limit. And now, here, here's some pictures of catch and release. Should these fish be released or kept? Y'all can put it in the chat what you think. But these fish in these pictures, I say these need to be released. These are your larger fish. Uh, they're mo well, two of the three are over seven pounds. Uh, it takes a while for them to get up to that, that size. Might as well go ahead and release them so someone else can catch them and they're not as good of table fare. But now move to the next slide. You're in a, an area Oh, it may have paused on me. Okay, so keep. You're good, buddy. Okay, it's just slow down here sometimes. Yeah. Uh, you're in an area where you're catching a lot of fish. They're small, usually under 14 inches, all about the same size. Or you're at a lake that has a sign like this, means they have a slot limit. For those slot limits to actually work and to increase uh, the size of the other bass, you need to take home your limit of fish if you can under that slot. Uh, those small fish, they eat a lot, and carrying capacity is what we strive for. I mean, bodies of water can only hold so many fish, so we want to get those smaller fish out so those bigger fish can get to trophy potential and we can catch them later. So we, we've got to take those smaller fish out. There's no reason not to keep them. They taste delicious. And now if you do want to keep a trophy fish, hey, as long as it's legal, that's on you, and I mean, a big fish makes a really nice mount. So uh, just think about that next time you're out fishing, if you're gonna keep a fish or release it. I mean, I'm always an advocate. If you wanna eat fish, keep those smaller ones that are legal and go out and have fun and make a great meal. I, I think it's time for Nick. I mean, I don't know if we've got time for Nick, but it's time for <laughs> Let Nick. Let me in, let me in. That's it. We're just trying All to get away from those matching shirts we were wearing the other day. <laughs> okay, 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 guys. This is the meat and potatoes of this uh, this uh, this talk here. Uh, we're talking about establishing a pattern, right? Uh, as an angler, you have two questions you're going to ask yourself: Where are the fish, and how do I catch them? Two pretty easy questions, right? Not really at all. Right, you will spend yourself day after day, hour after hour, trying to figure these these little green, slimy fish out. Um, how you how you establish a pattern? You're going to be looking at a lot of uh, very variations, right? You're looking at weather conditions, water temperature. Is it cloudy? Is it sunny? Uh, what's the water clarity? Uh, these are these are questions you're going to have to ask yourself, and how you um, 
you, you determine where you're going to fish and, and what you're going to use to catch those fish are all determined upon these conditions. Uh, so a, when, what I mean by establishing a pattern is different times of the year, fish are at different places eating different types of forage. Uh, here in Arkansas, our two main forage species are going to be crawfish and shad. Those are, if you throw anything that mimic those types of, uh, of bait fish or uh, forage, you're probably going to be right on, right on point. Now, where you're fishing really de de determines uh, water temperature is a huge key in that. Uh, so what we're talking about, the pre-spawn, spawn, and post-spawn, that's, that's all determined by by moon phase, we won't get into that, but water temperature is key. Uh, just remember that 60 degrees, the, the bass are gonna be going shallow, right? Uh, Largemouth bass are gonna spawn from inches of water down to eight foot, depending on the water clarity. So the fish, fish fry to have to have sunlight hit the, hit the fish's bed to be able to, to produce fish, right? Um, so depending on the water clarity really determines on how deep you're going to be fishing during the spawn. But basically during the spawn, you're going to be casting towards the bank. That's the best, best tip you can have. Uh, so when the pollen is coming off the trees and you're sneezing, you're thrown to the bank and you, you can't really go wrong. Um, so pre-spawn, we could go real in depth, but what you're going to be looking for is main lake points. They're going to be having a vast highway that they travel down to get to the spawning grounds. So spawning grounds are shallow flats, uh, usually in three to eight foot of water, but how they get there is how you have to kind of uh, follow them through their route, their highway to get there. And then you also follow them back in the, in the post spawn. So they start, they, they're living in, in the main lake. And uh, this is, you're saying in the winter time, they have wintering grounds and they have a, usually a creek that leads into the spawning flats um, that they're actually spawning in in the spring. Now, JJ, you better stop me before we get too too long. But uh, but what they're going to do, main lake points, that's where they're going to be stopping first in the spawn, in the in the pre-spawn. Then they're going to be traveling down that creek to the next secondary point or channel swing bank, uh, and then they're going to be heading back into the spawning flats, and that's going to be their last stop. And then they're going to uh, when the spawn is over, they're going to be doing the, the exact opposite, and they're chasing the oxygenated water um, that in, in the summertime, the, the, the vegetation, um, now Vic would know a whole lot more about this, but what they're doing is the oxygen in the water, it's not there uh, in, the, in the very shallow water, so they have to go where there is oxygenated water, and that's usually where it's deeper in the summertime, and you're just going to have to be chasing them around and a pattern can be a number of things. It could be a shad spawn in the morning time, uh, a frog bite, or any different type of thing on a different piece of structure at a different time of the day. And, and patterns, they change all the time. They're either working now or they won't be working. So as, a, as an angler, you have to ask yourself these questions and be very versatile. Uh, you have to be willing to, to try new things for something to eventually work. And um, that's, that's in a nutshell, that's establishing a pattern. We could go <laughs> on. If, if you really wanted to understand bass fishing, you better get a bucket of popcorn. <laughs> for a long yeah, time. I, yeah, I think that is definitely a, uh, for another night. I know that Nick, uh, like I said, Nick is super passionate about fishing and, and he could talk to you about it all day long, probably all night long, but so that we can get to the Q&A, um, we're going to move on. We're going to let Anne-Marie talk about a couple of resources that we have um, when you don't have a panel in front of you that you can, you can go to and, and find out a lot, a lot of this information. Hey, JJ. Yeah, I'm glad, that, I'm glad that we're coming back to it. You know, earlier I mentioned going to your local uh, angler shops, uh, local fishing stores. I think that is a great resource to have. Also, our virtual nature centers are going into one of our nature centers in person. That's another uh, really good resource. In fact, I want to say that you can, at the AGFC headquarters, you can check out a fishing pole. Is that, is that correct? Correct me if I'm wrong. 
maybe. Okay, we'll come back to that. Anyway, yeah, I think so. Uh, so the virtual. Sorry, I was on a. I, I lost my mouse for a minute. Uh, there's a <laughs> lot of locations where you can check out a fishing pole, and you can find that on our website under the tackle loaner program. There you go. Thank you, JJ. No problem, so sorry. that's a really good spot to go. And then also I found that as I've gotten more into bass fishing, especially as an adult, a really good resource is YouTube. Um, it, it is. I get on YouTube. That's how I learn uh, how to tie knots, which I know is available on the AGFC website um, and what baits to use when really just some solid tips on there. So uh, that, that would be my three places to go. Shops, AGFC, YouTube. Yep. Yep. YouTube, uh, the Virtual Nature Center has a whole section. Actually, at uh, agfc.com slash ARE, you'll find what's called the Fishing uh, Video Tackle Box, and it'll take you straight over to the Virtual Nature Center, and it'll tease out all those fishing uh, tip videos that we have made. So it is uh, it's a pretty good place to go. You might see a lot of will and a little bit of me on there too. So, all right, let's get into these uh, these questions. I know one that I saw earlier uh, that I think will be an easy uh, fix is how do you rig a finesse worm if somebody wants to tackle that real fast? Uh, Brad, you talked about soft plastics. Will is in your video, but I'm going to let Brad handle it. You said how to rig a finesse worm? Yep, how to rig a finesse worm. Okay, well, what I normally use um, when I rig a finesse worm is a jig head. And it's simply a lead, a piece of lead with a hook and a barb to hang on to the plastic. So what I would do, I take the worm, I start out, it has a flat side and a rounded start, side. I take the worm on the flat side with the hook uh, facing it and I'll poke it in up to the barb. Once I get to the barb, I'll pull it through the bottom, pull it out and I'll push it all the way up onto the head of the, of the jig, all the way up on the head of the jig. And then I'll come back and I find out where the hook is going to land and I'll punch it through all the way to the back of the, the worm. And I'll pull it out and I'll slightly cover it and it's called text pose. You, you barely cover it. So you allow that worm to pop out when you set the hook. And that's how I rig up my finesse worm. Thank you, and sir. You, and I love the fact that you had stuff on hand to go ahead and tack, and like not just tell us, but you showed us. So I appreciate that. Um, we had a question about Heavy pressured waters, uh, lots of tournaments, things like that. Uh, I know Will was supposed to take me for my birthday to go fish a tournament, and then he chickened out for me, so I'm going to put him on the spot here and have him talk about fishing heavily pressured tournaments or heavily pressured waters. You're muted, buddy. Pull it together. No, I mean, the phrase of 2020 and now into 2021. <laughs> uh, well, Nick kind of tackled this just a minute ago. Uh, the body of water we were talking about fishing the tournament was the Arkansas River in Little Rock, which is one of the he most heavily pressured areas in the state for bass fishing. Uh, but in that situation and really any other heavily pressured situation, I'm going to go with what Brad just showed for the most part. Uh, I'm going to go with small finesse baits. Uh, finesse worm with a 1 8 ounce jig head, 16 ounce. Uh, that's going to be a, usually about a two-watt hook. You're just going to want small baits, small line. Uh, that's really going to help you get more bites. Maybe not catch giant fish, but big fish like small baits as well. So uh, that, that's my technique for bait-wise uh, for heavily pressure waters. And then try to get away from the people. That's another, another tip is... If you're somewhere where people are fishing, move on. Or if there's a lot of boat traffic, if you're on like Greer's Ferry or one of the Hot Springs lakes, try to get away from it. And that, that will help you out a little bit as well. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there was a question about finding hidden overlooked bass fishing honey holes. 
I think if we knew the answer for that, it wouldn't be a hidden honey hole anymore. But uh, Vic, do you have any hot tips on how to find honey holes? You're the one that uh, appreciates nature and uh, getting away from things. So, all right. So we're talking uh, not, hit- not you, Vic. Nick. Oh, you said no. Vic. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm Vic, sorry. not Nick. I'm sorry, Nicholas. I'm JJ, I was answering a uh, a fly question on the chat. So oh, sorry. Uh, go back to oh, it was how to find honey holes that uh, are often overlooked. Yeah, so it, it's so I saw that uh, you know everybody uses Google Earth, and that's that's absolutely true. But um, if you're and I think Brian was kayak fisherman as well. Um, sometimes you can find places that just may be a little bit more out of the way that the big boats aren't going to get to. Um, you know, try to find places where access might be uh, an issue um, because there is that relationship between pressure and catch rate. So if you can find areas in a very heavily fished water body that may see less action, then that's probably going to help you out as well. Yeah, yeah I think that's a, a good tip. Let's see. Hey, I, JJ, another yes, thing uh, for looking for fish, a good resource on the AGFC website, we have uh, brush piles that are mapped out on our on our lakes. Golly, you are the best right now. Got it, man. You, you got my game. award. I, I don't know about uh, the fan favorite, but you, you're the, the all-star in my book. Um, let's see. Arkansas River and Dardanelle fish, safe to eat. Um, I would defer to – no, I'm not going to have to defer that. Yes, they are They are safe to eat. Um, if they're not, then I'm in trouble because I know I've had several fish out of the Arkansas River. But, yes, uh, there are no advisories on fish out of the Arkansas River. Let's see. And if y'all see a question on the chat panelists uh, that you really want to tackle, just get after it. I'm I'm not going to hold you up. We got three right. minutes left, so so throw hey, some in there. Yes, Tara. Jump. Somebody wants to know what's a good rod and reel for the beginner. Okay. Um, Zebco thirty three. <laughs> that that's that what's up. A, yeah. That's that's a good answer, and that's actually what we have in those tackle loaner locations because the Zeb. I always say that Zebco 33 is like the uh, the Remington 870 of the fishing world. So that's what we put in our tackle owner locations because it's uh, it's easy to use. It's it's not scary. You know, some people. That's why we didn't even really talk about bait casters tonight because uh, do you want to fish or do you want to be fixing a bird's nest all day? So. Uh, okay, well, but the video that we shared at the start uh, that we can put a link to in the chat also, it talks about a six foot, six and a half foot um, spinning rod with about eight pound test. I know there was a question about uh, what test line to put in there. Uh, you know, some people it's, there's a, I think eight foot's the most versatile, and that's what I would tell people, eight foot, eight pound is the most versatile. That's probably where we'd start, but, uh, you know, you've also got Vic talking about fly fishing, and, you know, the lighter, the better on that. So, it's just kind of a, uh, as you get more comfortable in the fishing, uh, you can go to that uh, lighter line, which is a little bit less visible for fish. Let's see anything else. Tara, did you see anything else? Um, somebody wanted to know, let me go back up here. Um, a beginner, how can you know like when to go fishing? When what are some conditions that might lead to helping to catch fish? Can I get it? Can I get it? Yeah, Nick. Nick, Nicholas, heel, heel. You, have, you have one minute and I will okay, okay. get you. So, so this was part of the, the stuff I, I was wanting to cover. But anyway, uh, weather conditions. You want to you wanna fish before a front comes in. Um, um, so after a front, fish get headaches. They, they're kind of just like us, right? We get headaches, high pressure, low pressure changes. Um, they will be on the front end of it uh, instead of the rear end of it. So they will feed heavily before a front comes in. Uh, Vic would know if high pressure or low pressure. I'm, I'm not sure exactly which one, but before front, I know that's a, a good time. Now, 
what I should have said about the the, the spinner baits earlier, a windy, uh, cloudy conditions are going to be perfect for that. So um, when the wind is chopping on the surface, right, it's it's separating light molecules from you know fish being able to see as well as they could, especially in clear water. Now you want a fish to see your lure, but not know what it is. You don't want it to know it's a lure. You want it to mimic uh, something that it's supposed to be eating, not knowing that it's a, you know, a Terminator spin, spinnerbait. Um, so those type of tactics, and also, um, it, it's really it's really key that you know uh, where the fish are located in these in these different locations. I know that's very vague, but they're on specific types of cover, depending on, you say the water's really muddy. They, they hold really close to structure, really close to woody structure, because they, they like to know where they're at. I guess in, if they're in the middle, they don't know where they're at. They don't have anything to sense with their lateral lines to know where they're positioned in maybe a current seam or something like that. Um, Okay, you did you did good if that was a, a end and not just a pause there, Nick. I was proud of you. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, we are we are at the hour, and before people start jumping off, I want to say uh, thank you all for sticking with us tonight. Uh, I know we covered a lot of material. And please feel free to, to email me with any further questions. We can get you pointed in the right direction. We have a ton of resources that we can share with you. Um, in the next few days, you'll be getting a, a follow-up email with a survey. There will be a recording of this that you can go back and, and watch it a million times because I know that you're just that engaged that you want to watch this three or four more times. But... You know, if there's something that you didn't quite catch, you can go back and look at it. Uh, we'll send out links to videos. And and we just really want to thank everybody for, for being on here. We will hold on here and answer any other questions that pop up. But I wanted to, to thank everybody before we got out of here. And we do this every month. Next month's going to be about brim fishing. So... Uh, be looking for that email telling you that registration's open and thank you all. If you want to hang on here with us, we'll, we'll answer a few more questions. JJ, I had someone ask if uh, we could post our emails, if they have any further questions after this, uh, you know, think of them down the road. I know your emails listed. I just put mine in the chat. Um, so I don't know how you want to go about that. Yeah. Yep, I'm typing mine in right now, even though I think most of these people already have it because my email is associated with the Zoom account. Mm -hmm. Follow our Facebook page. That's a really great resource yeah. to keep up with, uh, keep up with things. And, or, and also the Black Bass Facebook page. That's a really good one uh, to throw out there, Vic. Talks yeah. about stockings, habitat work. Um, habitat work's a big deal. Yeah, if we learned anything from COVID, it was that we had to be in the virtual world if we were going to connect with people over the last year. So um, we we had some success. We've had some failures, um, but we're, we're getting better every day. So we just want to be, we want to meet people where they are. And right now people are online. Mm -hmm. Better believe it. Yeah. Uh, there was a question about will this recording be posted um, I'm not sure they'll be posted, but we will give you a, a recording, a link to the recording. So you will definitely be able to go back and, and look at it uh, there, Penny. Uh, basically, will BOW happen this year? A non-fishing related question, but she probably goes to uh, fishing whenever she goes to BOW like everybody else does. It's the it's the hot uh, ticket item at BOW weekend. And the answer is we're hopeful, but we don't have, just like everything, we don't have any concrete answers right now. I hope so. Oh, no, it's a great weekend. Oh, it is. Great uh, program all around. Yeah, there was a question about bycatch. Um, 
if you're bass fishing and you don't catch a bass, what is the fish that you're most likely to catch? I catch crappie when I, a lot when I'm bass, especially with a wacky worm. If I'm fishing that yeah. way, I'll, I'll catch a crappie every once in a while. Yeah. Yeah, of the uh, of the many fish that we pulled into the boat, was that last week, Will? I don't even know when it was. I was the only one to bring in a crappie, so I think I won that award. Yeah, you did. You you won it. Uh, catch a, I catch a lot of drum. Both, and both ends. Yep, and both ends. Hey, they're fun. But you know, that's another that's another rig that I kind of wish we had talked about. That's another easy entry to bass fishing is a wacky worm. Which Brad, you can actually with just real quick with that hook that you have and one of those worms, show, show them what a wacky worm is. I sure will. All right. I've got that already set up as well too. This is what a wacky rig looks like. It's basically taking that worm and poking a hook right through the middle basically of it and just tossing it out there and giving it a twitch every now and again. And and it has unbelievable action in the water. And you twitch it a few times, just let it sink. You can also take little pieces of um, weight to stick in the, in the bottom end or the, the head end to allow it to fall uh, horizontally or head first or kind of tail first. But the action on it is really, really, really nice. It looks more natural than anything when it's fish mm -hmm. wacky style. And it's they basically just it. a hook in the middle of the worm. That's it. Thank you, Brad. Ooh, uh, beetle spin. Yep, yeah, beetle spin. You know, I never really think of it for bass, but I bet, I bet you can catch some bass on there. I, I typically just use that when I'm fishing for crappie. I mean, if I know anything about bass, it's the fact that if they're hungry, they're just going to attack. Mm -hmm. So, or, or like Nick was talking about, uh, if you're running through beds and stuff like that, they're trying to protect. So, yeah. Do you like the beetle spin? Yeah, yeah I, I like beetle spin. I mean, it's just a small scale down version of a spinner bait. Uh, works good for heavily pressured fish and works good just for a variety of fish. It doesn't matter if you're after just bass or not. I mean, it works great for bass, crappie, any of the sunfish. I mean, beetle spin, if I could only have one bait for my whole entire life, it might be a beetle spin. Bold statement, Mr. Hafner. Hey, I heard spin though. So, and he said it's like a spinner bait. Oh. <laughs> Oh, you saw Very what good. the you saw the votes in the chat. I know that you were uh, stacking the deck there, man. You you took that home. You did. We know that you've I been would. messaging people, telling them to vote for you. <laughs> uh -huh. It worked. AJ, <laughs> who won the? Uh, who sold their lure the best? I, I think Nick got it, man. I uh, sadly, he, he took three times the time, so he should have gotten at least three times the votes. <laughs> Let's see. Any new questions? If if you had a question in the chat and we missed it, uh, please throw it back in there. What was it, what about the one that was listed on the um, the notes there? The the last one there says oh, one is yeah. the best best soft plastics in the summertime. Yeah, I totally forgot about my uh, notes. Uh, yeah, yeah, the soft plastic for summertime. That would be the that large ten to twelve inch worm, mimicking kind of like the baby snakes out there. Um, it is amazing, and and some of the smaller bass will hit a twelve inch worm too. Matter of fact, I think I caught several ten inch ten inch bass on a twelve inch worm. So they go nuts that time of year during the summer for large worms, and they can be multiple colors. Most of the reds are going to be some of your popular. Uh, cherry seed, uh, plum, plum apple, any type of reddish color, long worm, bloodline. And literally one time before I actually caught a, caught a bass that spit up a baby snake, almost identical length of the worm I was throwing. I'm like, wow. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, there was a question about what do we think this cold snap's going to do? Uh, is it good or bad for largemouth? Um, I don't think it's going to 
mess a lot up. Now, for good or bad for largemouth fishing or good or bad for their health in general, um, fishing, I think it's going to uh, mess with things for a few days. But uh, as far as the health of the, of the bass, I think they're going to be okay. Yeah, that water temperature will cool down and uh, slow things down a little bit. But we'll get back there. It's just yeah. Arkansas weather. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I heard somebody talking about the weather today, and they are like, it's, you know, spring is just so up and down. I was like, what is winter? It's Arkansas. I mean, it's 70 one day, and then it's snowing the next, just like today was. Mm-hmm. So. Hey, here's a here's a really good question. We're in the beginning of floating season. What is a good all around setup to throw in a canoe for a quick float trip? Mm. Also, a good time to start fishing if you like to paddle and yeah. you're out on say the Buffalo River or uh, Crooked Creek or something like that. Get you a fishing license. Start fishing out there too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> Nick, did you want to answer it? Because, all right, buddy. I mean, we're off the clock now. You can you can just oh. run wild until I'm. So I pretty much lived on Crooked Creek when uh, when I worked in Yellville. But um, what the thing about floating in a kayak, right? So finesse tactics are very hard to to have happen when you're not in control of the boat. You can't control the speed. So finesse tactic is what we're talking about. Worm fishing, Texas rig, Carolina rig things like that, where you actively have to feel the end of the rod. Uh, a power fishing tactic like a spinner bait, buzz bait, a whopper plopper, uh, a crank bait, any of those things that you're actively just casting and retrieving. Uh, something like that in a canoe or a kayak where you're actively moving down the water, um, you, you can control and actually catch fish a lot easier than it would be if you're going down the water you know, trying to flip a flip a jig or uh, float a worm down. Um, so it's a lot more easy to just cast and retrieve while you're paddling and like dodging limbs and, and stuff like that. Yeah, I think you definitely would not want a uh, nine or 12 foot jig pole. Um, now, if you're kayaking in, you know, eat, like southeast Arkansas on flat water, but if you're you're in moving water, you're going to want to have a, a little bit shorter pole. I'm not saying one of those little uh, two footers or something like that, but definitely in the five five and a half foot. You know, you don't want a lot of stuff in your way. Oh, crawfish, yeah, man. This this right here is the ticket. Now, if you're like in a in a small river, creek, stream type thing, if you're if you're in the kayak moving. This guy right here, this is your ticket. The mimicking a crawfish, easy to throw, costs four bucks when you throw it in a tree and you kiss it goodbye. <laughs> it happens. Um, just get ready. If you love bass fishing, it, you will lose stuff. Rod, yeah. lures, everything. And I get upset every time I lose something. Uh, Nick, were you a guide on the White River a long time ago? Because that's in the chat right now. Uh, if they've got pictures of you guiding, I mean, that would be great. He's thinking about it. Yeah, he froze up. He's scared now. Oh, He's saying, like, no, that's Mick, not Nick. You said Nick? <laughs> yeah, Nick. Oh, not I Nick. thought you said Vic. If you oh, my got, gosh. This is the last with... time we have similar names on the same seminar. No, Will Will actually has fished the White River a whole lot more than me. Uh, well, I, it sounds like you were a guide a long time ago. No, I mean, I've yeah, fished the up. I fished uh, the lower White River, but not the north part of the White River. Well, yeah, well, I know, I know. The No, I, I was not a guide. I wish, I would love, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> okay. I, I like guiding, You're but... I like teaching better. Guiding and teaching, that's two totally two different things. Gotcha. Um, let's see. Anything else on here? I think I think we've got it. Um, like I said, if you're still hanging on here because we didn't answer your question and I'm about to sign us off. Uh, feel free to send me a nasty email tomorrow. And we'll get your question answered. Um, 
Hey, Thanks, my brother. email's on there too. Please yeah. feel free to reach out anytime. I mean, even if it's not just for fishing, uh, if you have any other questions, I'm always available. That's that's the beauty about working for Game of Fish. I mean, I was in fisheries for a long time, but you know, hunting's still something that I'm passionate about as well. So we're good resources for across the board. So I appreciate everybody. I definitely appreciate this panel because I was uh, I was a little bit nervous about getting on live talking about bass fishing, but uh, with this group around me, I felt like we could tackle it. So thank you very much, illustrious panel. And we will be doing this. Uh, I've got my calendar somewhere, but May 18th, we're going to be talking about brim fishing because uh, what comes after bass, it's, it's time to get on those brim beds. So we will be doing that the third Tuesday of the month, six o'clock, and be looking at your emails for the link for registration. I appreciate it. Everybody go out there and, well, I'd say go fishing, but uh, it's blowing about 20 right now and it's uh, dropping about as fast. So uh, maybe go fishing this weekend. Maybe that's the ticket. I'm doing it, man. I'm All going right. this weekend. Yep. Hey, this was awesome. Thanks for putting it together, JJ. Hey, thank y'all for being here. For coming. All right.